Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. You may notice, if you've seen some of my other videos, that the lighting looks ever so slightly different. And that is because I am playing around with a ring light for the first time. So do let me know what you think of that in the comments section down below. In today's video, I want to talk about another text from history that I find particularly interesting, and especially a section from it. Today, I'm talking about Hans Talhofer. Hans Talhofer was a 15th century German mercenary, martial expert and fencing master. We place his date of birth between 1410 and 1415 and we give as a date of death sometime after 1482. During his lifetime, Hans Talhofer produces a number of fencing manuscripts, manuals and treatises. The purpose, we think, in part of these documents was as a teaching aid. Talhofer could use the images and the text that he was creating to teach his students. We think his students probably came from the elite, the nobility. In order to employ the expertise and services of a man such as Talhofer, you would need to have money. And so that means that the nobility is a pretty good target demographic for Talhofer to be approaching in order to ply his trade. But what is he training his clientele to do? Well, he's training them in their martial endeavours. This might be tournaments, maybe even war. And certainly, in some cases, he is training them to participate and hopefully win trials by combat or judicial duels. I'm not going to lay out the full context for the judicial duel or trial by combat now, because frankly, it's very complex, both legally and also spiritually. And I think it probably deserves a video all of its own. If there is something you would be interested in, then let me know in the comment section down below and I will see what I can do. Something that is both interesting and somewhat confusing for me in the way that Talhofer presents judicial duelling in his manuscript is the fact that he represents multiple walks of life as being involved. Now, trial by combat is not the sole preserve of the nobility. It could arguably be used or affect multiple walks of life. In fact, anybody could use or be called to a trial by combat. What's confusing to me is if we accept the fact that Talhofer is producing these texts in part as a teaching aid, that he is teaching, broadly speaking, paying customers, the nobility, why does he take the time to represent this variety and span of society? So that's one question that I would like to ask you. What do you think is going on here? The text of Talhofer's that I would like to focus on today was produced, we believe, in 1467. The patron of this manuscript is Eberhardt, Graf von Württemberg. It is a fencing and wrestling manual, made up of 137 folio pages, double-sided. The illustrations within the text, some of which we're going to be focusing on very closely today, are attributed to Stefan Schreiber. But before we get into the particular section that I want to look at most closely, let's look at the contents of the manuscript as a whole. In Talhofer's 1467 text, this is the order of contents. So, as you can see, first up we have the front matter, then we have images and text dealing with longsword, then armoured fencing, then the use of the poleaxe, we have the long shield, dagger, grappling, so a form of wrestling, we have the messer, a very particular sword, we have sword and buckler fighting, we have a duel between a man and a woman, and we have mounted fencing. All of the sections in this manuscript are fascinating in their own right, and they all deserve further investigation. But today's video is about the second to last, the section that deals with a duel between a man and a woman. I'm particularly interested by this section because maybe, just maybe, it forces us to question some of our preconceptions about the past. To horribly misquote Pride and Prejudice, it is a truth universally acknowledged that the historical woman was a damsel in distress, with no martial agency, no permission or prowess to defend herself or others using violence. 
And perhaps that's true. Certainly, the document evidence, the image evidence, doesn't point to there being a lot of women wielding a sword or a cudgel in the past. But I would argue that this might be a case of erasure rather than absence. And my reasoning for this is the fact that women, for large swathes of our history, were deemed to be property. Property of husbands, property of fathers, property of brothers. And the value of them as property was in large part put down to their chastity. And that makes sexual assault and rape a property crime, as horrible as that is. But the flip side of that is if your property has the capacity in any way to defend itself from devaluation, would you not give it not only the permission, but potentially the training to do so? Is it not maybe in the best interests of husbands, fathers and brothers to train women to defend themselves so that their marital value may be preserved? Over the next few months or even years, I intend to create almost a compendium of evidence of women fighting. We already have my video on Mary Frith that I'm gonna link up here. But I want to find individuals who are known to have fought, wielded a sword or a curtle ax, put on armor and rode into battle or defended themselves against assault or kept their castle safe from onslaught. And that's where it's a call to action for you all. If you know of any of these women, if there is a particular figure from history that fascinates you, then please do let me know in the comment section down below or come and find me over on my social media and let me know there. I want to make this playlist of martial women and I would love your input while I'm doing it. But right now, I'm gonna go back to the Talhofer manuscript and this particular section on a duel between a man and a woman. And I'm going to go through image by image. So let's start with the first. Let's begin by looking at how this particular trial by combat has been laid out, how the, let's say, arena is set up. As you can see, a hole has been dug in the floor in which the man is standing. He is in this hole up to his waist. The woman stands over him. Evidently, I would say this looks like an attempt to redress the balance in the physical differences between man and woman. It seems that Talhofer is assuming that a woman will not be able to best a man if they are literally on level footing. I think it is also worth mentioning that it's not clear whether these images are supposed to follow on one from another, almost like a comic strip, where they tell the narrative of a single fight. Instead, it's possible that these are sample moves, things that could be used to defend yourself or attack your opponent and get the advantage over them. Nevertheless, we see, first of all, the fighting stance at the beginning. Both opponents hold their respective weapons aloft above their heads. The man holds in his hand a club, although it does appear to have a sharpened point to it. The woman has a cloth with a stone in it. Various scholars have argued that this may in fact be the veil for her head, that she has taken off her veil and has put a rock in it. Perhaps to further highlight the fact that this is a female fighting a male, she is using a garment that is traditionally associated with a woman to do that fighting. Both participants in this duel are wearing the same type of clothing. As you can see, it looks like what we would call a onesie with a hood. It would seem that the woman is spinning her cloth with a rock in it over her head in order to achieve this sort of straight line of the cloth. That must be what she's doing. The next image shows that she has wrapped her weapon around her opponent's arm. It is the arm in which he holds his sharpened club. Perhaps her intention was to break rather than bind his arm, because now her weapon is wrapped around her opponent. And maybe she misjudged his strength. In the next image, he has flipped her onto her back and he now points his cudgel at her flesh and he is attempting to strangle her. In what may be the next in this series of events, she has managed to flip over. She's broken away from his hold and now she strangles him. It looks like she is laying on top of his weapon as if to prevent it causing harm to her. Then she finds a way to partially stand up. As you can see, she's in this lunge position. She has grabbed his head and is attempting to pull him backwards out of his hold, arching his back over her knee. To do so, however, both her hands must be employed. As you can see, 
his hands and his weapon are free. In the next image, we perhaps see the result of that. With his free arm, he has reached up, dragged her over his shoulder as attempting to pull her head first into his hole. This next image doesn't seem to logically follow on from the one that went before, mostly because she is out of the hole and we're not quite sure how she got there. In this image, Talhofer warns the female combatant to not step too close when trying to strike, as it seems to have given her opponent the appropriate distance to land a quite nasty strike in between her legs and possibly be able to drag her to the floor. In the next image, she has also not maintained appropriate distance. She has wrapped her weapon around her opponent's neck and that has bought him the range to strike her in the chest. In the final image I want to look at, she has, I believe, achieved total and full dominance over her opponent. She has him clasped around the neck, strangling him. She also has grabbed him by the genitals with the other hand and it seems that she is dragging him out of the hole. While Talhofer's images show potential moves for a fight, maybe different ways a fight could end, it would seem that perhaps he is showing what happens when the man wins, but also what could happen when the woman wins. However, I must caveat that, because it's not clear what would constitute a win in the case of this particular trial by combat. Is it the woman dragging the man out of the hole? Is it the man dragging the woman into the hole? Is it first blood or even death? We aren't sure. But what seems to be happening here is that Hans Talhofer is showing a man or a woman how they could win in a judicial duel against the other. If these texts are in fact teaching aids, does this mean that Talhofer is expecting to teach a woman or even that he already has? Is Talhofer ready to help a woman prepare for a trial by combat? What do you think? What is Hans Talhofer doing with this section of his manuscript? Is it evidence that women could be permitted to act on their own behalf in trials by combat? Is Talhofer merely presenting a possibility? In the unlikely event that a woman could not find a male second to act on her behalf in order to defend her legal standing or even her honour, is Talhofer saying, well then, she must be expected to act on her own behalf? Or is this Talhofer's joke? Is the idea of a woman being involved in a trial by combat so ridiculous that he is putting it in his text in order to amuse his noble patron? I'd love to know what you think, so let me know in the comments section down below. Or come and find me over on my social media, I'll be leaving the links in the description box. You can follow me there and we can continue the conversation. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.